Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds. Welcome to Ape's video notes for topic 8.9, which will cover solid waste disposal. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe methods of solid waste disposal. We'll also be looking at the effects of solid waste disposal on the environment. The skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video will involve using data to support a potential solution to an environmental issue. So we'll start off today by talking about what solid waste actually is, the different types, and the sources or where it comes from. So the first term we need to know is MSW, which does not stand for Masters of Social Work in Apes. It stands for Municipal Solid Waste. This is just Apes lingo for solid waste, garbage, trash, litter, all of those things that we throw away and don't think about. Um, and so where does it come from? Largely households, businesses, schools, etc. cetera. Uh, and so if we look at what, again, some synonyms would be in common language, trash, litter, garbage, the reason I put refuse in here is because you may see the word refuse on an APES exam. It's a fancy word for waste, especially physical waste, like garbage or trash. Um, so if we look at the waste stream, the waste stream is going to refer to all of the solid waste that's produced and kind of the flow of it or where it actually goes. And so some of it goes to recycling centers, sometimes to landfills or trash incineration or burning, which we'll talk about in future videos here. So one thing we need to know about the waste stream or the MSW stream, as it's sometimes called, is what it's made up of. Uh, and so about a third of it is paper. And so that's recyclable, of course. Um, but when we look at what actually ends up in landfills or what's produced as waste, about a third of it is paper. And then about two thirds of it is organic. And so that other third that's not paper or cardboard would be things like food waste or yard trimmings. And so this is compostable. And the reason that I point this out is because this could be a huge potential to reduce our MSW stream reduce what goes in the landfills by recycling and by composting this organic matter, which can be broken down by microbes in a process called decomposition. And one type of MSW that we need to be specifically aware of here is called e-waste. So e-waste is just electronics that are discarded. So it could be old computers, TVs, phones, tablets. And the reason that these are important to be aware of is that even though they make up only 2% of the MSW stream, they have harmful metals in them or other compounds that can be endocrine disruptors. These could be things like lead, uh, cadmium is a metal that's often used in electronics, could be mercury, could be PBDEs, which remember are flame proofing materials. And so all of these can act as endocrine disruptors if they are leached out of landfills that contain e-waste. So this is a reason that it's important for e-waste to be disposed of properly, which means taking it to some sort of recycling facility that specializes in e-waste, so that those metals can hopefully be recovered, reused, rather than just being discarded in landfills where again, leaching can release these endocrine disruptors into groundwater or into nearby soil. Next, we'll be talking about sanitary landfills. Now, sanitary landfills sound really fancy, but they're just apes lingo for landfills. So where developed nations bury trash and kind of control conditions. But I wanna contrast this from a dump, uh, which is still used in many areas of the word uh, world and a dump just refers to an area where trash is dumped you know there might be a hole in the ground but there's probably not all of these safety precautions taken and so we're going to look at some of the features of sanitary landfills below so we have this great diagram here which we're going to be referencing throughout this slide but the first thing i want to call your attention to is this black kind of perimeter around the landfill and that's going to be a clay or a plastic bottom liner this liner is meant to basically line the hole in the ground and try to prevent pollutants from leaking out into groundwater or soil nearby. I have an asterisk on prevent because uh, we know that most landfills do have some residual level of pollutants that are leaking out of them. And so despite our best efforts to contain them, it's not a perfect system. And so there is some contamination often of nearby ground and nearby soil, uh, nearby groundwater and soil. So if we look here at another method that we can use, it's a leachate collection system. And so if we look um, basically along the bottom of this landfill, just above that black perimeter, the clay liner, the plastic liner, you'll see a vertical tube uh, connected to a horizontal tube, and that's basically pumping out leachate. Now leachate is the water that drains through the garbage that's in a landfill, and it may carry pollutants with it. And so what's gonna happen is again, it can be basically piped out by these series of tubes, carried to a treatment system that can try to remove as many of these pollutants as possible and then you know release that water elsewhere. Then we have a methane recovery system. 
So the methane recovery system here consists of pipes that go down into the landfill and due to the anaerobic decomposition in a landfill, due to there not being enough oxygen there for fully aerobic decomposition, we're gonna produce a lot of methane, a lot of CH4. So these pipes can actually harvest it where sometimes it can be used to heat buildings or produce electricity, but it needs to be removed in some way so that the volume of the landfill doesn't expand and so that we don't have the potential for there to be explosions or there to be methane gas leaking out. Finally, we'll look at the clay cap. So the clay cap is going to be used typically once the landfill is done or when it's filled. And the clay will be piled over the landfill and then soil can be added on top of the clay so that the area can be kind of reclaimed meaning that natural vegetation can be brought back in. This also keeps out animals and tries to you know, control the smell that may be coming from a landfill and basically just tries to reestablish some semblance of a natural habitat. It's probably not going to be quite the same ecosystem it was before, but having soil and grass and vegetation there is better than leaving it just with a bare you know, soil surface. Next, we'll take a look at different items that go into landfills and the rates of decomposition in landfills. So we need to know that landfills generally have really, really low rates of decomposition. And that's because the three things that are most critical to decomposition, which would be oxygen levels, moisture levels, and organic material content, those very rarely occur in the combinations needed for decomposition. So as a result, landfill volumes typically remain pretty stable. There isn't a lot of decomposition and there isn't a lot of breakdown of that matter. So there isn't a lot of reduction in the volume of landfills once they're filled. Um, let's take a look at an example of this. Uh, so there's a study done by a Stanford professor who dug up what was in landfills, basically was big cores that they put down into the ground, almost like you do a soil core. And they found instances of newspaper headlines that were 40 years old and were still legible. So this is a great example of how little decomposition there is in landfills. We can look at this graphic, which just shows us the basic time of different items breaking down in landfills. And so we can see that many items don't break down on any time of human time scale, you know, 600 years for fishing line. That's essentially not breaking down in any sort of usable time frame for humans. And so many items that we produce just aren't really biodegradable in a timeline that's feasible. And so that's going to lead to landfills largely retaining their initial volume. Let's look at some items that should not go in landfills. Anything that contains hazardous waste, so these are wastes that are especially toxic, antifreeze, motor oil, cleaners, or electronics, think back to e-waste. Um, these are often going to be things that have endocrine disruptors or are just really toxic to organisms, and so we don't want them to leach out and get into the surrounding soil or water. Metals like copper or aluminum, uh, these shouldn't be thrown away because they can be recycled and they're valuable and we use them, and so recycling them is a great option. And then old tires. <laughs> Old tires are an example of just one of the bizarre kind of apes minutia points that for whatever reason, we just have to know. So old tires, if they're left in huge piles, uh, can collect water and can become breeding grounds for mosquitoes. Again, there's just been a bizarre kind of relationship between people who designed the apes course and this concept. It's been on FRQs. It's in the CED now. It's just one of those fun apes quirks. You just have to know that you know, tires are breeding grounds for mosquitoes if they're left in big piles. So they should not be left in big piles. And then finally, we have things that should be landfilled. So cardboard or food wrappers that have too much food on them, they just can't be recycled. And it actually ruins the materials that are added to the recycling batch or, or what's going to the recycling center when there is a lot of food left on them. So they do have to be thrown away. Um, rubber, plastic, uh, films, and wraps, so the things that come around food, oftentimes they just don't recycle easily, they need to be thrown away. And then styrofoam, styrofoam is not recyclable. Um, and then I have down here at the end, food, yard waste, and paper can go into landfills, they often do, they're about two thirds of what goes into landfills, but they can be diverted by, of course, recycling paper, um, but then composting yard waste or food scraps. And so while they end up in landfills, they don't necessarily have to, and they could easily be diverted with composting or recycling initiative. Now let's take a look at some issues that arise from landfill placement and use. So the first two issues that we'll focus on are big environmental consequences, which would be groundwater contamination and the release of greenhouse gases. So remember that groundwater, so aquifers or just water that exists in soil layers, you know, beneath the surface, can be contaminated with the leachate from landfills. So oftentimes this leachate could contain heavy metals, lead, mercury, 
or acids, if we're talking about you know, batteries being disposed of from cars or other large batteries, medications, or just bacteria that exists in landfills. All of these things can be carried out of the landfills with leachate if there is a leak or a hole in the plastic or the clay liner that's supposed to be containing that leachate. Then we have greenhouse gas emissions. So there are going to be gases that are released from the decomposition, both aerobic decomposition and anaerobic decomposition. So that means carbon dioxide and methane are both produced from landfills. Now, again, we try to collect these with collection systems and harvest it and use it, but there's some inevitable release of both carbon dioxide and methane from landfills, and both of those contribute to global climate change. Another issue that arises is NIMBY. So NIMBY is this idea that no citizen really wants a landfill in their backyard. So it stands for not in my backyard. And there's a number of reasons behind this. Um, of course, there's the sight and the smell. Nobody wants to look out their back window and see a landfill, uh, much less smell it on their morning walk. And so that's just going to be a big issue for many residents. They can also attract you know, vermin or organisms that carry disease or are just obnoxious, rats and crows or seagulls in this case. Um, and then there's, of course, the groundwater contamination concerns. So if you are using well water or you're drawing water from a nearby river or stream for any purpose or kayaking in it, fishing in it, you don't want the possibility that these pollutants, again, heavy metals, acids, medications, that they're leaching out of the landfill and into the groundwater. And remember that groundwater oftentimes filters into streams and rivers, and so you could contaminate rivers and streams that way as well. And so because of all of these reasons, landfills should be located far away from water sources, especially rivers and streams or groundwater sources that are used for human drinking. An issue that also arises is social justice. And so many times we know that landfills are produced or are cited, I should say, in predominantly communities of color and low income communities. There are studies that actually show how strong of a predictor the socioeconomic status and the racial makeup of communities are when it comes to where landfills are placed. And so this is just a great example of the intersection of environmental justice and social justice when it comes to landfills. Again, we know that they're more likely to be placed in communities that don't have the resources to advocate against them. Those are often low, low income communities and they're often communities of color. And finally, we'll wrap up today by talking about waste incineration and ocean dumping. So waste can be burned um, for two main reasons. One reason it can be incinerated or burned is to just reduce the volume. Um, and we should know from a chemical standpoint here that because most waste is going to be paper, plastic, and food, it's primarily hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, which makes it very combustible. And so it's going to be very easily burned. So that can be done to, again, reduce its volume. And so it can reduce volume by up to 90%. That means we can use a landfill for 90% more time. We can put 90% more total waste in it by burning off so much of that volume. The problem is that this will release air pollutants. So it can release carbon dioxide, it can release particulate matter, SOx and NOx, just as combustion of really any biomass does. Um, what Another issue that arises here is the bottom ash. So the bottom ash that's produced when we burn waste will have a lot of toxicants in it. It will have lead, mercury, potentially cadmium if there's e-waste. And so that needs to be stored in ash ponds and really controlled uh, tightly. Now, the problem is, though, those ash ponds will sometimes flood and that could release all of these toxicants into nearby ecosystems, whether that's surface waters or soils. Um, and so eventually, though, they should be emptied and they should be taken to, you know, special landfills that are especially lined and especially monitored to really try to control these pollutants. Again, though, I bring this up because there's ideal situations in all of this waste management and there's situations that we know happen, which is the overflow of these waste ponds. Um, then we can have a picture here to kind of give us a visual to think about what this looks like. So we're incinerating trash here, and then we have all of these ponds where the toxic uh, bottom ash is stored. And again, if it's disposed of properly, then it is contained in some sort of landfill that's especially lined and monitored. But if there's an event where it overflows into the surrounding ecosystem, then we have the release of really toxic metals. It can be incinerated to generate electricity. Um, again, just think through the steps here. Anything you can burn, you can turn into electricity because you can heat water into steam, turn a turbine, and then you have a generator that creates electricity. So we'll cover this more in depth in topic 8.10, but I just want to introduce it now. 
And then finally, we should know about illegal ocean dumping. So it is not best practice by any means to dump trash directly into the ocean, but we need to know that it's the reality in some countries that have far fewer environmental protection laws or just have less ability to enforce those laws. So they may not be able to send you know, workers out to monitor the oceans or to figure out who's dumping the pollutants and to hit them with a fine or some other penalty that prevents them. And we should know that this leads to basically floating islands. I'm using air quotes around islands of, of garbage because the Pacific uh, garbage patch is a little bit of a misnomer. It's not quite this like continuous thing the size of Texas. It's more like that's an area that has a lot of floating garbage in it. But either way, it can lead to really large patches of floating garbage, which can limit light penetrating below the surface but it can also suffocate organisms. So they can get tangled in the trash, they can get ensnared, not be able to move or swim. Um, they can also die through suffocation if they choke on it or if they swallow it and it leads to asphyxiation. So for practice, FRQ 8.9 today, I want you to take a look at the makeup of MSW in the United States and try to propose a solution that the federal government could enact that would reduce the volume of waste entering landfills by the US by at least 15%. And so you need to use evidence from the graph in order to support your proposed solution. So pay attention to that 15% reduction that they're aiming for, and then make sure you're using evidence from the graph to support the solution that you've proposed.